Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Buon pomeriggio, uh, buongiorno. I am really delighted eh, to, per me è un grande to, uh, piacere e onore poter moderare il panel che è 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 il panel Italian è Minister un of panel for eh, che the vedrà la partecipazione Alessandro del Ministro Bruno, della Difesa italiano Renzo Querini, the, Presidente della Brucca. Is Brookings and uh, actually MED represents a uh, wonderful occasion to uh, underline those two uh, uh, those two partnerships we are deeply involved in and we are developing. And this particular panel, of course, always keeping in mind the uh, Mediterranean dimension. And when I say Mediterranean, I of course have in mind the enlarged concept of the region. Uh, keeping in mind this focus, it's, we will speak about security and defense. We consider security and defense as triggers, important triggers uh, that shape the evolution of the global arena and the evolution of what is happening in the region, especially nowadays when uh, we have to deal with such a, an imposing black swan as COVID pandemia and the consequences of it also, as far as security is concerned, uh, we feel in a speed that this kind of uh, phenomena and this kind of aspects and the point of view of security and the point of view of defense is of uh, utmost importance and utmost uh, outstanding significance. Minister Guerini is actually flying to materially to the region for a state visit, uh, so he uh, uh, is not able to join us live, but uh, he uh, sent us a video message for this panel, and I would beg the organizers to please uh, make the video of Minister Guerini start. Thank you. Ambassador Massolo, authorities, dear guests, it is with great pleasure that I am taking part in this edition of the uh, MED Dialogues. I would like to thank the organizers for this opportunity of uh, allowing me to speak on behalf of Italian Defense in this forum of uh, discussion on the new trends in uh, security and the defense industry. I would like to address my special thanks to you, uh, to the president of the panel, and um, warm uh, greetings to the other members of the panel. We are experiencing a very um, an ever-changing uh, political scenario. Uh, there are several national interests in the wider Mediterranean, which is a point of encounter, but also of um, instability and unpredictability characterized by an increasing complexity, a complexity uh, that um, is influenced by uh, important international actors, and then we also have had this systemic shock of, con of uh, COVID-19 that all of our countries are tackling. Uh, the situation in Syria, the Eastern Mediterranean, access to the uh, sea routes and access to energy resources are only some of the pockets of instability that we have to cope with. Uh, we have had 10 years of radical changes and conflicts and changes in the relationships uh, between uh, international organizations and the states. Uh, and the pandemic has accelerated this and its consequences. So in this scenario, we are experiencing, we are witnessing a renewed military competition amongst the various states. 
who, whose uh, technological characteristics are quite advanced with great innovation in uh, space and in uh, uh, the web. And then there are also uh, the uh, traditional settings. And there are some players that are extremely assertive. So the context is extremely complex and uh, uh, multifaceted. Uh, and there are new players that are appearing on the scene, players who have an impact on international uh, equilibrium um, and uh, with an impact also on foreign policy and defense policy. So there are many challenges that uh, we need to uh, face. First and foremost, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is a test to resilience and to the ability of uh, various countries to give a prompt response. There are many crises and armed conflicts in the region. So this is an emergency that has brought an added value to, um, uh, to defense and what it can offer well beyond the military um, aspect and the institutional defense of the state. Now, all this was possible thanks to the uh, capacity of the armed forces in, uh, um, in uh, experiencing and in doing their job. With it has, um, they have contributed to the, to the uh, response to the COVID crisis. So there are many challenges that. Um, uh, have aspects that are in common with uh, mili the military context that require a prompt answer and technological instruments. So it is self-evident that it is necessary to strengthen the uh, capacity of the state in responding to crises by investing in security and defense through a vision that is far-sighted and that takes into account the country as a whole. This vision cannot ignore two fundamental aspects. On the one hand, relaunching the political debate on uh, defense and its role, which is uh, ever more important. And then uh, the industrial segment that, together with the armed forces, must face the, uh, these emerging challenges. So from this standpoint, it is some time now that uh, I have been interacting at the institutional level uh, with the aim of widening the, the way defense is perceived in order to have Italians understand that um, uh, the uh, uh, investments in defense is not money removed from other more um, sectors that are believed to be more investments, but it is an investment in security, in sovereignty, and economic prosperity. The defense industry is an incubator for research and development and technological innovation. It is capable of bringing together essential aspects of international security with a, an industrial dimension, which is a multiplier besides being a catalyst for investments. It is an enabling factor for the growth of the uh, national economy and of the world economy, and especially in moments of uh, crisis such as the present one. The defense industry, and I said this uh, clearly to the parliamentary uh, committees, well, uh, they um, account for our sovereignty and uh, for belonging to the group of technologically advanced countries. So the defense industry uh, is important and it must take an active part in a um, forward-looking view of the country. Now, how can this be done? I think that it can be done through competitiveness, innovation, investment in research and development, and the ability to ensure technological excellence that uh, the military uh, needs uh, so that Italy, so that our country should not depend on foreign technology, on foreign products. Uh, and it can be a strategic partner in uh, cooperation, bilateral or multilateral cooperation, and so that it may play a role as a protagonist in the leading programs of international investment. In order to face the challenges of the present day and of the future, we need to promote and develop international synergies at the political and industrial levels. And we need to reassort the importance of political and military and industrial partnerships as a factor of stability. So the prospect, the long-term prospect of defense 
cannot ignore the uh, an, an active role in developing uh, the common uh, p- military capacities also at the European level so as to seize the opportunities that of instruments introduced recently, such uh, structured uh, uh, cooperation and uh, the IDF and uh, the forms of uh, uh, joint investment. So I think that uh, the the initiative uh, taken in May, together with the French, Spanish and German uh, groups, we have uh, traced the development lines of uh, European defense. My de Castri, Uh, intends to integrate resources amongst the member states with the long-term aim of achieving strategic autonomy, both in terms of the ability to intervene and with regard to technology and industrial capacity. Clearly, and this this is done in, uh, com- in complementarity and in synergy with NATO, in the light of the debate of recent months, The promoting action of Italy towards development and a European military capacity must be interpreted as being an action aimed at strengthening the European pillar of the Atlantic Alliance, bearing in mind that the transatlantic pact is indissoluble. So uh, there, in a, um, there is burden sharing. We uh, wish to enhance the cooperation between the EU and NATO and not a divestment from uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, pact. And the um, defense, um, defense, our defense must uh, pursue international partnerships which will enable it to keep high The, uh, our, the ability of our country, excellence and uh, uh, other elements enable Italy to take part in advanced programs at the international level. So I, th- I think that the Italian industry of defense is undoubtedly in a position to face this uh, challenge. It can rise to the ch- challenge. It has type, top players. Uh, And uh, there is also a strate- strategic capacity. Uh, our production capacity of, our, of the Italian small and medium-sized enterprises, government, and in particular defense, are determined to do their share. They ensure their institutional support to national companies, especially with a view to their being present on the international scenario. Defense and uh, the industry are an instrument for uh, competence and capacity for Italy as a whole, uh, and it ensured capable of ensuring resilience and security, and capable of giving a, of being a driver of economic uh, um, development. As I said last year, in the uh, in our policy, I intend to pursue this process through some key elements. Requalifying uh, uh, expenditure and uh, financial resources, the ability to implement programs and to give to boost exports uh, within a framework of uh, an increase of investments. An important result in this direction is represented by the uh, budget law, which is currently being examined, is before Parliament, which envisages long-term instruments for investments in defense and in the aerospace sector. In the long term, starting from 2021, 12.3 billion euros will be invested and they will give stability and depth to the money that the industry needs so that they can plan investments that are lasting in the area of innovation, employment, cooperation, and global competitiveness. I hope that Parliament will confirm the indications that the government has set forth and the responsibilities that it has taken on in the Budget um, uh, uh, Act which is before Parliament. So the defense also has uh, uh, goals that are part of a national approach. And uh, recently, I revitalized the process for 
the uh, technological and industrial aspect of defense so as to ensure cooperation between defense, the universities, industry, and the other arms of government. So with this policy, my aim is to uh, pave the way to be followed uh, in meeting the operational needs of a military instrument and provide support to the national industry, including the small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, to increase the competitiveness of Italy in the world. Now, for this purpose, I think that it is a priority to um, support exports by implementing the G2G instrument, which uh, uh, envisages uh, cooperation with Austria, and a recent MOU was signed with uh, Austria to set up an example of the potential of this instrument. So in uh, concluding my remarks, I would like to say that uh, it is possible to state that the institutions and defense in particular are working in synergy and proactively at the international level to support the uh, uh, defense industry, which must continue to maintain and to grow or increase its technological capacity, its commercial capacity. Now, all this... Uh, uh, means that we are committed to making efforts in order to uh, win all of the uh, global challenges, the technological challenges that uh, we are facing by strengthening Italy, the European Union, and the Atlantic uh, Alliance um, in a prospect of resilience and of the fact of being in the vanguard at the technological level and we will rise to the challenges and threats that uh, lie ahead. So I think that this is an opportunity which is extremely important. And for this reason, I thank you for your attention and uh, I wish you a fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Italian Minister of Defense. He just shed light on policies that the government is developing in defense and security matters as far as Italy is concerned. I will now call General Allen, begging him to driving on his experience to set a little bit the scene for us here, speaking a bit about how the security uh, landscape is changing in the region. Uh, threats, actors, agendas are new and there is a risk that the region is running that is uh, to be under a process of security fragmentation. Uh, what can you tell us about this and to what extent uh, security and military dimension is decisive here as a matter of fact? General, the floor is yours. Yep, Joe Piero, it's great to see you again. Uh, thank you for the invitation to once again join the MED. And Alessandro, it's uh, it's always good to see you, sir. Um, <clears throat> my my sincere regret is that uh, we're not all doing this in Rome, uh, where hopefully next year we will be. Um, so let me start by saying that uh, we uh, in the United States are very sensitive to the challenges that many of the countries around the world are facing with respect to uh, COVID-19 right now. And in particular, we know that Italy uh, both suffered a lot from it, but also Italy has, in many respects, set uh, the standard for how to deal with this crisis. And so we've learned from you, but we've also had the, you and the Italian people in Italy in our prayers uh, as we've all struggled to come through this disease. Um, Don Piero, you ask a, an important question, but I, I have to take a step back from that question. Um, and I hope to be able to answer it, but, but I need to say that uh, we, we should expect uh, that with the, the uh, inauguration of the Biden administration, you're going to see uh, a different America uh, in the region. Uh, and a, a couple of things that I'll, some points that I'll make, because I, it, we really have to make these points because if I don't, then it's difficult to create context for the environment. The first is that uh, you are beginning to see unfold in the United States 
uh, a series of uh, nominations by the Biden administration of individuals who are uh, who are deeply uh, experienced in their roles, but also deeply experienced in in the area, in the region. Uh, so that's the first thing. You're, you're, you will see uh, individuals appointed both to the Secretary of Defense, uh, whose name is yet to be nominated, but I think we all have a sense that of those who are being considered, all of them are extraordinarily well qualified. We've seen Tony Blinken be nominated to be the Secretary of State. Uh, Tony has deep experience in Europe, and I would, I would imagine, though I won't ever try to speak for him, that he would consider himself an internationalist and a Europeanist. Um, and he's, he, of course, he speaks fluent French and, and has deep uh, ties into the region. Uh, we've seen Jake Sullivan uh, be nominated to be the national security advisor. Again, enormous experience in this regard. And, and from that then, several things. One is that you can, you can expect that the United States under the Biden administration will very quickly uh, state or express its support for NATO. Uh, and while you heard American officials in the last administration or the current administration uh, talk about NATO, there won't be any doubt in anyone's mind that the United States is committed to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and in particular, uh, Article 5. You'll see that the United States views the EU as a partner and not as President Trump once said, a foe, the number one foe, in fact, of America. The EU will be a partner. Uh, you will see that we uh, in the United States uh, once again view our international relations in the context of our role within multilateralism. And that's really important. Uh, we have always believed that the strength of US foreign policy doesn't exist in isolation from our commitment to multilateralism and multilateral organizations. So I'll make a very important point. Uh, one of the other nominees that was just uh, uh, announced is uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. And Thomas Ambassador Greenfield is steeped in Africa. And I think what you're going to see is an extraordinarily important uh, emphasis by the United States on the region of the Mediterranean, but very importantly on the global south. And while we'll deal with Russia and we'll deal with China in the context of uh, great power competition, uh, and as Russia is in fact a, uh, a, a, a opponent and adversary with respect to NATO, I think you're going to see an important American emphasis uh, on the Mediterranean and very importantly on the South, because it, in many respects, while I believe that the NATO, uh, both collectively and through the strength of the United States by itself under this new administration, has the capacity to manage the Russia relationship, I do believe that we all have to work together to deal with the issues of the South. And if we don't, I think it, it will be from the South that we will find some of the greatest potentially unmanageable challenges that we will face in the future. Now, that said, with, I think, greater experience in the key positions in the US government, a lot of competence, that we're all gonna appreciate, uh, a greater emphasis on multilateralism and the support of international organizations like the UN, like the World Health Organization, uh, World Health Organization. I think you will then see that there will be uh, aspects of the US role in the, in the region, the Mediterranean in particular, that may seem to be different than you've seen before. Um, for example, I think that we'll see a different view of the United States with respect to Israel and Palestine. I think you'll see a different role with the uh, view of the United States with respect to its relationship with Saudi Arabia. And in particular, the issue associated with the humanitarian catastrophe that we've all seen unfold with respect to Yemen. Uh, I think you'll see a US interest in Libya. Uh, and I know that of course, uh, Libya has been both a source of instability in the region, but also a source of of immigration into Southern Europe and, and the solution to the Libyan problem uh, will be very important both to Europe, but also to Libya and neighbor, neighboring countries, but also in Africa as well. I think you'll see a, a different potential US uh, view with respect to uh, Syria. 
Uh, and of course, uh, you will see, uh, and it's been talked about recently and with the recent assassination of Dr. Fakhrizadeh uh, in uh, Iran, I think you will see a different uh, perspective of this administration with respect to Iran. And in fact, in co consistent with uh, the intent of this administration uh, to act multilaterally, there has been a conversation about um, rejoining the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, as it relates to Iran. And of course, we've all been very carefully watching the potential for Iranian uh, reaction to the assassination of uh, Dr. Fakhrit today. Uh, with the potential that uh, an untoward retaliation might in fact spark a, a broader and greater conflict in the region, which could in fact foreclose options by the Biden administration ultimately to pursue a joint comprehensive uh, plan of action. Uh, and then I think uh, you, you will see that the, the United States, as it has drawn down the conflict in uh, Iraq and continues to draw down its presence in uh, Afghanistan, that we may see a difference uh, in our force posture. Although I want to be very careful not to telegraph uh, any decisions that have been made. We can expect that the new Secretary of Defense will want to do a global force posture review to determine that the forces that we have are postured around the world in the way that supports not just US security, but the security of our, of our allies as well. Now, of course, you said, what about the region itself and changes and trends in the region? We have seen uh, greater interest by the Russians in the region. That, that is something that we'll have to uh, uh, in, uh, digest in the context of a new national security strategy that would emanate from the Biden administration, from which then a national defense strategy will come. Uh, we have seen uh, continued and, in fact, increased Chinese interest in the region. Although that's not necessarily a bad thing since they're a source of foreign direct investment, we'll need to see whether China's role in this region is in fact a stabilizing region or a, a, a stabilizing influence or a destabilizing influence. But then we'll see that many of the militaries in the region have increased its capabilities technologically. And this, this to the Minister of Defense, Minister Guarini's uh, point, uh, the technologies are changing. And the technologies and hands of relatively smaller countries have really significant capabilities. And so I think uh, a good example of that, of course, is uh, the attack on the Abqaq oil and gas separation facility in, in uh, Saudi Arabia by I Iran last year. That was a very sophisticated use of uh, drone technology uh, and cruise missile technology. We hadn't seen that before. And so there are technological advances uh, there, are, there are roles for uh, extra regional great powers in the region. There is greater assertiveness uh, of the powers in the region. The discovery of uh, energy in the Eastern Mediterranean has now created a dynamic that I think the United States will take great interest in, not because we, the country has a personal interest, except insofar as that the outcome uh, is a stabilizing outcome and not a destabilizing, potentially militarily escalatory outcome. So it's a, it's a very interesting time. New energy sources, greater access to technology, strategic competition that may be playing out between the United States, Russia, and China, changes in the relations between the Arab states and the Israelis, which changes the dynamic really dramatically in the region. Uh, plus the potential that we need to seriously now get after these civil wars that have created such instability, the likelihood of uh, conflict-based migration into Europe itself. We saw that in 2015, destabilize the, the uh, politics in Europe. And then finally, people ask me, what's the greatest threat to the United States over the long term? And my answer isn't what they expect. They expect it's about China or it's about Russia. Yeah, we'll figure out a way forward with them, frankly greatest threat to the United States security, and it is to Italy's as well, is climate. And climate will create a whole series of conditions that will fundamentally change geostrategy, geopolitics. Uh, and with many of the climate scientists expecting that the conditions will be such in the developing world, where as many as 150 billion or 150 million people may be climate migrants by 2070. Uh, Europe has got to take the global south 
very seriously. We all do in the context of creating opportunity in Africa and not have Africa become the platform for uh, uncontrollable climate migration. This is a great opportunity for us to work together in that regard on behalf of Africa. Uh, but we have to seize this as an opportunity and not permit it to pass. So I'm sorry to go on so long, but I needed to give you the context on where we stand with the future U.S. administration and how it may be, be viewing things in the, in the region. Thank you very much, John. Uh, actually, it sounds uh, challenging and encouraging at the same time. I have to say that our thoughts are with the United States, with the American people. We, are, uh, we have a struggle in common, one among many struggles we have in common, but against the pandemia and against COVID. And our thoughts are going to uh, the people that, no, that are no longer with us, uh, both in the United States and in Europe and in Italy in particular. Thank you. Uh, Actually, uh, we were missing a bit the United States, I must say, from the region. And so uh, what you were saying, what you are saying, what you just said, uh, sounds encouraging uh, chiefly for that. And we are eager to be able to work, to work together and in order to, uh, to try to, uh, to join efforts to, uh, to be effective against our common challenges. And those challenges and this changing reality is also something is, that is in the radar of a major defense industry, of defense industry as such. And I would like to ask to Alessandro Profumo, actually, who is uh, leading a, uh, a prominent defense, uh, def defense enterprise, European defense enterprise, uh, how uh, and in what ways the defense industry intends to adapt to this new reality, changing realities in the region, but also changing rules of engagement in the world? Alessandro, the floor is yours. Uh, you have to unmute. You have to unmute. Here we are. Hear me? Sorry. Um, so I, I was saying many thanks, Gian Piero, and many thanks to ISPI for having invited me. Uh, I, I have to say that it's not easy to speak after uh, our minister, our defense minister, and after uh, General Allen uh, gave us uh, a so important picture. And I would like to uh, take out from uh, what uh, General Allen just said to us and Minister Guerini some uh, 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 key point uh, uh, in order to say what is the reaction of the uh, of our industry at least or what is the reaction of Leonardo what are we trying to do in order to to manage uh, this different world uh, General and uh, uh, John said uh, uh, first of all that there are uh, different threats um, that America will be more present in the area which is incredibly relevant uh, support for NATO. Uh, I think that in many cases, and you know better than me, Gian Piero, when we are talking of uh, European sovereignty, we are uh, uh, we have a misleading concept of being in competition with US. I think it's completely wrong this view, uh, but really completely wrong. We are part of NATO, and uh, whatever we spend uh, in order to to maintain our uh, technological capability is in order to have a, a stronger relation with NATO. And also, there is a concept that, in my opinion, is uh, really at the base of our future, which is uh, interoperability. And uh, without a very significant interoperability, we'll never be um, uh, secure. And so I think it's, uh, it's really uh, relevant. Uh, General Annan said as well, uh, you will be a partner. Uh, I think that you has to be you, not uh, a sum of countries. Um, because in defense, in many cases, uh, we are a sum of countries, so we are not uh, a, a player. I, I fully, I know perfectly that uh, uh, a significant portion of the uh, defense uh, activity is based uh, still on uh, national IP, national capabilities, and not uh, European IP or European capabilities. But we must have in mind the fact that uh, Europe within NATO and with NATO it has to be the framework in which uh, all of us will work. Having said that, uh, 
uh, uh, what uh, we are living is the fact that technologies are evolving dramatically. And I would say that the platforms are becoming less and less relevant, uh, and information, uh, uh, which is, uh, sorry, secure information. So it's a combination of uh, uh, the way you, uh, you receive the information, the way you store the information, the way you use information uh, will be more and more uh, relevant. Uh, so, um, secure, uh, se secure security, cyber security will be a key element. Uh, availability, so also the space uh, uh, domain uh, will be incredibly uh, relevant. Uh, all uh, the uh, cryptography could be quantum cryptography or uh, uh, other uh, capability in order to have uh, uh, secure storage and secure communication will be relevant. And then the platform uh, and sensor will be a way in order to interconnect and uh, enlarge uh, uh, the uh, information superiority that will be key, in my opinion, uh, in uh, managing any future threat. So, um, as Leonardo, this is one of the reasons why we are investing so much in uh, high performance computer, artificial intelligence, uh, cloud storage, uh, uh, augmented reality, uh, um, machine learning. So, because uh, simulation, uh, uh, artificial intelligence applied to command and control systems. So, because we think that, again, platform and sensor will become uh, important uh, in uh, uh, as, uh, as much as uh, we have the capability of having a multi-platform uh, 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 information system uh, that will be uh, uh, rapid, uh, will be capable to manage uh, millions of information, uh, to manage and to give back uh, the information uh, to, the, to the decision makers uh, in an efficient way. So um, the world is changing incredibly uh, rapidly. Uh, um, I think that our industry has to be ready to manage uh, uh, this uh, innovation uh, uh, in the proper way. Uh, this is uh, uh, incredibly interesting for all of us. Huh? Uh, so this is also the reason why all of us we are investing in uh, uh, in. Uh, software and uh, other uh, uh, electronics capabilities, uh, in many cases, uh, having this uh, business uh, uh, quite uh, deeply rooted in our uh, soul, in some other case, uh, starting from a platform and trying to develop uh, a new electronics capability. But again, I think that this uh, will be uh, incredibly rare. On top of that, there are all the other elements like uh, hypersonic uh, directed uh, energy weapons, uh, uh, biotechnological uh, uh, elements, and new materials. Uh, for instance, uh, we are working a lot on composite uh, uh, with uh, the combination of other materials in order to lighten our, uh, uh, our platforms, uh, whatever it is. Uh. General uh, Allen uh, spoke as well of uh, autonomous systems uh, that, again, in our opinion, are uh, mainly uh, based on uh, the capability of managing properly the mission, the mission system uh, and uh, all the elements which are related to that. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, actually, I will turn again to uh, John Allen. Uh, Alessandro Profumo was speaking about how industry uh, is adapting its tools to a change it and to a changed and constantly changing reality. Uh, I would like to ask you, it's the concept of war itself that is changing. That is, we are accustomed to uh, interstate conflicts of armed conflicts. Now uh, something else is taking place, much more immaterial, non-state actors, uh, fading distinction between who is actually the enemy, who is a combatant on which side. Everything has uh, a hybrid sounding nowadays. Uh, I mean, what does it mean for the region? And more in general, what does it mean for the future trajectory of warfare in your opinion? 
Well, it, it's an important uh, question, obviously. It may, in fact, be the, the central question. Alessandro's context that he provided us was really valuable uh, in, in understanding, if you will, the platform from which conflict will emerge. And let me make a couple of uh, broad comments. You know, often, <clears throat> often we use the term war uh, as the, the basis from which our thinking uh, should emerge. And I think that the, the nature of the threats uh, that we are facing today, as your question implies, Jean-Pierre, uh, they're multifaceted, uh, they are transnational, they are subnational, uh, and, and very importantly, they are multi-domain. This goes to Alessandro's uh, comments. Uh, and increasingly, we find that where in the context of war, most individuals uh, had greatest meaning in the physical dimension uh, with physical destruction or the threat of physical destruction uh, as the logical outcome of waging war. I think we now can use a term which is not war, but because we are operating in a multi-domain environment nearly constantly, where as Alessandro said, supercomputing within 10 years, probably quantum computing, uh, big data analytics, cloud resources, artificial intelligence. I think what we will see is more and more conflict will take place in the cyber domain uh, more so than necessarily, or if it does occur in the physical domain, the cyber domain will have set up conflict so that decisions can be achieved in the physical domain or maybe even in the cyber domain. And I'm getting a bit technical here, but the advances in technology, just in the areas that Alessandro said, which is in big data analytics, supercomputing. I'm afraid and we lost. Al uh, AI based algorithm. How do you have me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think what we will see is that the combination of these technologies will increase the speed of conflict and the multi-domain relevance of conflict to a point where it's going to make it very difficult for the human dimension in conflict to exist without the support of high-end technology. And we call that hyperwar, not because of the technologies, but because of the speed. And traditionally, the time from the idea to the decision to the action was defined in physical terms. But increasingly, the distance from the idea to the decision to the action can be defined much more quickly and then sometimes at the speed of light in the cyber dimension. And this just changes everything about how you consider warfare overall and conflict. So today, for example, I think we're in conflict. We're in a situation of conflict where strategic influence operations through the use of artificial intelligence and micro targeting isn't blowing up buildings in downtown, pick the city, but it is fundamentally attempting to reorient the minds of our citizens to have a different view of our politics, which ultimately can change the geo strategy of a particular country. So as we think about war going forward, we still have to be able to wage conflict in the physical domain. But increasingly, and this is where I think defense industry is really important, increasingly, uh, some of the most decisive dimensions of conflict will not occur in the physical domain. They will occur in the cyber domain. And as we see, in fact, I go from this briefing to a very specific briefing on this, as we see advances in biotechnology, specifically on brain-computer interface uh, and human-machine interface, 
the capacity of reducing the time from the thought to the action can be quite, quite short as technology continues to evolve. And you asked me about non-state actors. You know, first of all, let me make a really important point. One of the reasons that the transatlantic relationship is valuable, valuable to us all, I think, is because of our shared values. Uh, we have shared values that have sustained us in the context of human rights, commitment to the rule of law, the embrace of democracy, uh, capitalist and technologically advanced economies. Those things are unique to us as a community of nations. It's been called the West in the past. I think that's too, too exclusive a term, but the first thing is we all share our values. Now, those same technologies though are available to some states that don't share our values at all. They're authoritarian or they're totalitarian or they're slipping into illiberalism and they have proxy organizations. Sometimes they're transnational criminal networks. Sometimes they are simply uh, sub elements with technological capabilities that do their bidding as proxies that can do great harm to us and go back to Alessandro's point about cybersecurity being so important. So while technology have, has the capacity in the context of artificial intelligence and human machine interface to be of enormous value to do good for all of us in the future, in the hands of those authoritarian states, which are not so committed to the values that we are, every day we're committed to these values by our technologies because of that and in the service of that, uh, we have a real problem potentially coming at us in the context of the speed of conflict, particularly in the cyber domain, waging these technologies in a valueless system where we must still operate in a system of values, which may make us slower, uh, but still consistent with our values. This is a dilemma that we face as technology continues to move and technology just isn't improving. The rate of the change of technology, and of course, no one knows this better than Leonardo, the rate of change of technology is also in incredibly fast. So we have to balance where the, the role of the human is in this process called the nature of war. And for us, it's not just the role of the human, it's the values-based human against the character of war, which is the technology, and the rate of the change of technology. And keeping those in some kind of an equilibrium is the great challenge ahead of us in being able to be competitive in the role of conflict. And I'll stop there. I'm sorry I went on so long. No, no, it's okay. Thank you very much, John. Very important remarks. And thank you also for this humanistic approach. I, I must say I appreciate it very much. Putting human being at the center, after all, of all this kind of, of reasoning, all this kind of framework. Uh, not to sound prosaic, but I would, I would ask Alessandro Profumo, all this, all this imposing uh, necessity of adaptation, uh, you need huge budgets for us, for it. and governments are already embattled because of COVID, because of so many other priorities. Uh, how you think, from the point of view of a big defense enterprise, how you think to cope with this? What about private investment, other shareholders, foreign customers? I, I mean, to develop this critical mass of investments to be able to cope. No, many thanks uh, for the question. Before answering to your question, I'd like to stress uh, one of the concepts uh, John uh, just uh, said. Uh, uh, this uh, concept of common values. Uh, I think that this uh, we have to consider as non-negotiable. So we sure. cannot discuss, uh, uh, because uh, uh, John said something which is always in, in front of us, uh, speed versus values. I think that the values are not uh, negotiable. So uh, as industry, uh, then uh, all the other players have to do something in this uh, respect. We have to consider how having our values and keeping our values as a cornerstone of our activity to, speed, to be speed enough in order to be successful. But not uh, to start uh, to open the discussion on uh, if the values can be maintained or not. 
because unless uh, we know where we start, we don't know where we, we will finish. And uh, in my opinion, uh, this is uh, incredibly dangerous. Having said that, uh, uh, I think it's uh, is, uh, very relevant what the Minister Guerini said before, uh, uh, when he stressed uh, the fact that uh, uh, he knows perfectly that the national customer is incredibly relevant for research and development. Um, we know that this is true in all the countries where we are. So, for instance, for us uh, being based uh, in four, uh, having four different markets uh, as domestic markets, Italy, UK, US, and, and Poland, uh, we leverage uh, on uh, the domestic demand in order to develop uh, new capabilities. And uh, the, the key uh, issue for me is uh, to be uh, so capable and so strong in the discussion with our domestic domestic customers in order to develop something that is good for the domestic market uh, but can be can be exported as well uh, you share a, a company that knows uh, that perfectly we usually develop the best uh, ship uh, the best aircraft uh, the best uh, uh, helicopter in many cases are so good uh, that are very expensive and cannot be exported um, so we have to be uh, capable uh, in uh, the discussion with our domestic customer to, uh, to uh, keep them uh, uh, at the frontier in terms of uh, 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 capabilities uh, of, the, uh, of uh, our uh, service and good to answer to their uh, requisite, but as well uh, to maintain uh, <clears throat> some uh, uh, feature that can be uh, utilized for the international market as well. In this perspective, I think that uh, what we were saying before, uh, so the uh, uh, technology, the, all of the digital uh, uh, capabilities that we can add uh, to our products can uh, be really one of the uh, key element because uh, are elements uh, of differentiation. Uh, so the national customer can have something uh, in terms of digital capability that the, the other won't have. Uh, and if we consider, for instance, uh, uh, cyber warfare or uh, some uh, feature of radar or uh, some uh, element uh, in terms of uh, um, sensor, uh, uh, infrared, and so on. So there are many, many, many elements as well. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, space uh, uh, character technology. Uh, so there are many elements that can be a sort of a differentiator. So on the base uh, of a, a common system that is good for export as well, uh, uh, you add on elements that uh, we create uh, uh, the national independence. Having said that, we know perfectly that the, the, the different countries are reacting in a different way to COVID, uh, also in terms of uh, uh, military budget. Uh, we know perfectly defense budget. We know perfectly that up to now uh, there are no uh, cut in uh, defense budget uh, almost everywhere because uh, it is true that the COVID is putting under pressure the national budget, but it's true as well uh, the tensions are uh, fueled by COVID. Uh, the immigration issue uh, uh, related to climate uh, is, a, is a very clear example, but there are many other elements. Uh, being in Europe, that, uh, to talk of uh, the European uh, defense system is also relevant in order to optimize uh, the way we spend our money. Uh, today we have seven, 17 uh, different uh, uh, tanks uh, in Europe, uh, in US, I think, are two or three. Uh, so this is uh, clearly uh, an issue in terms of uh, efficiency for non recurring cost. Thank you. We have five minutes left. Uh, I have time for two for, for two very quick Questions and very quick. We lost uh, General Allen. Call me. I'm not seeing any more General Allen. John, are you there? John, are you there with us? 
we lost him. We lost him, yes, I think so. Uh, while we are uh, trying to, uh, to get back to, to General Allen, just a quick a question, a follow-up to what you were just saying. That is def uh, European defense. Uh, what role for the industry? Leaders or followers of the governments? That is guiding the governments or waiting for the governments to take decisions? Unmute. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, I think that uh, we don't have to be nor uh, follower, nor leader, but partners. So we must have a continuous discussion with our governments uh, in order to uh, build a common strategy which is in the interest of our nations. Very clear and very shareable, if I may say so. So I don't think that... Uh, for me, at least, today is a reality. Uh, and, but you know better than me, we are continuously in touch with our government in order, all of us, uh, in order to discuss on uh, what we can do uh, in the best way. I, I think that today there are more issues in terms of coordination within the industries than uh, with the government. Sometimes, yes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> okay, so I think that we didn't uh, get back in our connection with General Allen, so I, I would stop here. I would thank General Allen and Alessandro Profumo for their very important remarks and for their participation. And thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. Many thanks, uh, Jean-Pierre, and to all the friends of ESP. Thank you. Bye-bye.